this is my review of The Clone Wars, which ran from 2008 until 2020. So I'm going to start by telling you this was a show that I really loved. This video will have some jokes, and I will get into some serious topics. Now, let's see. Um, yeah. To be clear, this will be my review of both the pilot movie and the show itself, since the film is technically part of the show, it's basically the pilot. And no, I'm not going to let the meh and sometimes bad of the movie ruin the excellence of the show for me. If you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the show and the movie don't really hold up, you know, been outdone by later stuff because of that, not as much fun to watch today, whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time, and I don't intend to spoil anything in this video. If I end up d deciding I w will spoil something, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. D do note, I will not be warning for spoilers for anything Star Wars that came out before 2008, since, you know, it's pretty significant to the, yeah. You know, this is set between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. I have watched every single episode once each, and, let's see, so yes. Set between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, it follows the adventures of Obi-Wan, Anakin, and other Jedi, including Ahsoka Tano, the rare female named Jedi who gets to have a personality and character, clone troopers named who get to have a personality and character, and a number of the worlds and peoples affected by the war. Now, this is definitely one of those shows where you ba you really do need to know, you know, essentially... The only thing you need to have watched before you watch the show is Phantom Menace, The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. But if you haven't watched both of those, there is stuff in this that is just you're you're going to be lost. You know, but you don't need to have watched the original trilogy, although I recommend it. And the you know, some of the Some of the later stuff, there's maybe references to stuff that's come out, you know, in the in the final season, which came out in 2020. They did have some references to stuff that had come out, you know, in between, since the season 6 came out in 2014. But you don't need to have watched in order to, yeah. This is definitely a show that you can binge. I personally watched, you know, typically two episodes per day. Sometimes just one, but yeah. And let's see the yeah. Um, you know, the words this movie teaches valuable lessons will sometimes get a very well earned primal fight or flight response. It's so often ham fisted. A lot of the time, even the children are barely tolerating how patronizing the show is being. But this show really does a great job at integrating the lessons well. It doesn't feel like it's telling you how to be or behave. It is slightly frustrating that some of the things they kind of go back and forth on, but, you know. It's usually subtle. So the writing, the let's see, yeah, um, it makes a ton of sense to do an ongoing series for Star Wars. You know, it started out as a very unexpected movie that was anticipated to be a one-off, and then the further they kept going with making movies the more they ended up limiting themselves by trying to adhere to audience expectations of what a Star Wars movie was. This show has tons of stories that they would never be able to do well in a traditional Star Wars movie. Countless of them, that's right. For some reason, no one has been able to count them. Of them don't even, you know, wouldn't even work as a feature length, but they're ideal for one or a handful of 22-minute episodes. 
Now, some critics say it's not really a kid's show. It's mature and complex. It can be watched by older children. Honestly, there are episodes of the show I don't think should be watched in full by anyone whose age is still in single digits. Like, if you're a parent and you're worried about, you know, will my kids be able to handle this, maybe try... You know, if you don't have time to, to watch the episodes before you show them to your kids, you know, maybe Google, like, uh, um, what's it called? There's probably, like, a list of, you know, what are the, the episodes that are most, you know, what, yeah, what episodes should not be watched by children. And let's see. Yeah, and another critic quote, the show features episodes that make it clear in war there are no good guys and right choices. Now, for those who might not be aware, every single season, all seven, and episode, all 133, is on Disney+. Plus. So if you want to watch it, you don't have to buy the individual season sets. And since, uh, you know, most episodes are 22 minutes long, you know, the the a couple of them are slightly longer. I'm not sure there are any that are shorter. You know, if you feel like binging, I mean, roughly 49 hours, like a weekend or two, depending on, you know, how much your body needs to sleep, I guess. And maybe skipping certain episodes. I'm not personally going to be providing a list of episodes to watch. My personal recommendation is to just watch all of them. I think they're all worth watching. If you do want a designated list of episodes to watch, Google it. There's plenty of them out there. Now, not everyone will want to start their viewing of the show with the movie, and that's perfectly fine. You're not going to be confused. It's very unusual for me to tell people to skip an early part of an ongoing story. I personally don't hate the movie, but I do understand why a lot of people do. So, you know, maybe just to be on the safe side, you'll want to start your, your viewing with the first episode of Season 1, and then if you feel like it, you can watch the movie once you've watched all the seasons. You know, that was what Doug, Wal Doug Walker did, and he seemed fairly happy with his decision. You know, personally, I did watch everything in the order that, you know, I, yeah, I watched the movie first, and then I watched the episodes in the order that they aired. I did also watch the movie back in 2008, when it first came out. I, I didn't go to see it in theaters. I got a copy from my library. And back then, I also thought it's fine, you know, like, in some ways, I like it better than the prequel trilogy, I, I get why, you know, it was definitely not what people were expecting. I, I do think that if you're going to watch it, don't watch it thinking this is a Star Wars movie. Watch it thinking, okay, so this is a pitch. This is a pilot. This is proof of concept. They're just going to tell me what this show is going to be like. You know, it's not the best episodes that they made into the movie. It's not like... It's not something you need to see before you start on the rest of the show. And it is one of those things where... It, this is one of countless shows where it took a little time before they found their feet. You know, I, I don't know. They, um, I think they stepped in invisibility goo, and that was the, the issue there. Before they kind of figure out exactly what the show is going to be like, there is some like growing pains really early on. And unfortunately, that is also in the movie. So, you know, and, and yeah, some people also say just skip season one, which I think there are some really excellent episodes, but I, I can kind of understand what they mean. So whether Star Wars to you means lots of Jedi and lightsabers, guerrilla tactics by uneven groups of unlikely heroes and alliances, big battles on planets or in space, aliens, humans, romance, this has it. Not every single episode, but... Uh, yeah, plenty of each of those things. And, uh, yeah, I think overall it's maybe... There's probably more progressive messages, but there are also some conservative... You know, this was made not that long after, you know... Yeah, I guess in some ways, the you know, you still see, like, post-9-11 in, in, you know, movies and, and shows... But when this was made, that was very much like, so, you know, there's, like, torture and, and such. Which, 
I will grant there was always torture in Star Wars, but, you know, it tended to be, you know, in the original trilogy, the torture is like, okay, this is just evil. The bad guys are the ones torturing people, you know, but yeah. Now, let's see, right, and yeah, so I, I have some issues with the prequels that are not in the original trilogy, so, you know, Lucas's uh, dialogue is not going to be, because that was in the original trilogy, but yeah, so in the prequel movies, the war is meaningless, Palpatine wins regardless, the show focuses a lot on the personal, which hits a lot harder. The shift of Anakin from good to evil is too abrupt, keeps going back and forth. Here he's more consistent and the shift is gradual. And, uh, yeah, the prequel movies have too much politics. I love politics in movies, I just don't think it will... I, I do think there's too much of them in the... Yeah, the show does a better job making the politics interesting, in part because it has more screen time and not letting the politics take over. And, yeah, in, in Revenge of the Sith, you know, a bunch of the battle scenes, I can't really tell who's winning. I can always tell in the show. And the issue of, you know, you wonder why did the Jedis lose? They're so ridiculously OP. That's actually worse in the show. And let's see. Yeah, I, I find too little emotional engagement with the prequel movies. It's a lot better in the show. The prequel movies are too busy visually, the show is not, and let's see, yeah, the world building in the prequel movies too, isn't too much of a rush to provide context, which is a lot better in the show, and the show does explain why at least some of the characters that we see in the show, that, you know, why they are not in Revenge of the Sith, despite, you know, Order 66, like, it feels like, okay, if you're if you're serious about this thing of, you know, they kill all the Jedi, wh what exactly, you know, what about the Jedi that are introduced in this show that, you know, not addressed in the, in Revenge of the Sith? Now, let's see, right, so yeah, any piece of media that is about war, especially made in the Hollywood system, in particular during and right after war efforts, including World War II, Vietnam, very much so for ones made post 9-11, one has to look at whether or not it is pro-war propaganda. And certainly there are times when this makes war look fun, uncom uncomplicated, easy to win, and easy to like, you know, one of the big problems with, you know, war is collateral damage, and sometimes this show doesn't really, you know, basically they're they're completely separate. But other times it does acknowledge that it really affects the the you know civilians close by let's see and uh, yeah at, at times the torture appear, you know is is depicted in this show as being a useful tool rather than not a source of credible intel other times it is you know it is the other way around and it is sometimes only the evil characters who use torture. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, you know, it is a show where a few teenagers, at the insistence of adult authority figures like clones, Jedi, get involved in war. So that's, yeah. You know, like, I, I realize it's not the only Saturday morning cartoon to have young, you know, children and teenagers be involved in war, but, like, something that you know, I, I'll admit it's been forever since I watched, let's see, there were two Sonic shows. I think it was the one called Sad AM. It was, it was the, you know, Blue Streak Speeds By, Sonic the Hedgehog, that one. From what I recall, it was basically that, like, you know, the adults, a lot of the adults are, are I don't remember if they were uh, maybe prisoners or... or dead or something, but from what I remember, it was basically that, you know, there's not really anybody else, and I I think that's a more, like, because basically that means that the kids get to live out the fantasy, 
But if something bad happens in the real world, they might be like, okay, you know, there are adults handling this. I don't have to be a pun where this is a show that says, you know, I mean, if you if you're strong with the force or if you were bred to be a soldier, I don't really care that you're a teenager still. Here, grab a weapon. The enemy is there. I expect results, you know, and that's not great. But yeah, very frequently, this show does criticize war, acknowledging it makes monsters of everyone without acquitting war criminals. And yes, the guys on the other side can aim, and you may lose countless people, some of them close friends. You know, maybe you'll even end up hurting someone on your own side. And let's see. Yeah, since this features characters not in Revenge of the Sith, we don't know if they make it or not. Unfortunately, a lot of the time it does focus on people we do know will make it. You know, there are there's a lot of focus on Anakin, Obi Wan, and Padme. To to a lesser extent, Padme, but especially you know Anakin is in a lot of the show, and so is Obi Wan. And like. I get it, I get that they want to, you know, and they definitely, they, they have a more compelling relationship here than in Attack of the Clones, certainly. And, let's see, it almost never happens that the show, like, wastes your time. There's very rarely stuff happening without either progressing plot or examining theme. And, let's see, sometimes characters will be stuck in one location for a while, and the situation worsens they have, as they have to deal with multiple threats. Each time one is defeated or escaped, they run into another. This is a time-tested, effective way to get an entire episode out of relatively limited means. And that is also, like, you know, in, in American TV shows, you can often tell and this was, you know, the uh, let's see, I guess the last two seasons were streaming. But the first five were on TV. You can usually tell, okay, they ran out of the budget here. Uh, you know, they were just, they, were, they do a bottle episode or something. And I mean, sure, there are some episodes. I, I never felt like an episode of this was just like, okay... I don't know. We it's hard, man. It's hard to write twenty-two episodes to an to one season. Let's just half-ass this one. Now, uh, let's see what at first might appear to be anti-droid sentiment, which obviously in real life, without droids with AI being abused, it's not super important, but could be taken as coded racism is really a pro-individuality message. You should go against your programming. You should not do what is expected of you unless that is good. Uh, you know, A New Hope does open with R2, a droid, going against his original programming, and it saves the day. And, yeah, you know, across this, like, it still does have the issue, you know, the pop culture detective, I want to say the video is called The Tragedy of Droids in Star Wars. It does have that issue, but... Sometimes there is a lot of empathy for them also. And let's see. And yeah, some the, the show acknowledges, you know, sadly it is true as an officer, it's basically impossible to completely avoid people dying, so you just got you gotta make it count. And let's see. See. Yeah, there are, you know, arcs across episodes, but, you know, episodes also do tend to have a beginning, middle, and end. And, let's see. yeah, so, the, the pilot. I get that by the time the movie was released, there were some very specific expectations for what you would get from a Star Wars movie. But I can't help but note the things that are different from the, the yeah from the from the the episode movies you know episodes one through nine of the Star Wars movies you know they do still take inspiration from some of the same places like instead of the opening crawl we have this World War II style newsreel update on how the war is going the way that a bunch of World War II things help inspire the way things are in the original trilogy. And the opening of most episodes has a written message, basically the moral of the episode. Some people really hate that. 
you know, I think it's fine. I didn't really feel like it was condescending. And let's see. So yeah, um, technically the pilot here is the movie, which a lot of people hate. I personally think it's fine. It's not as good as the show itself. But now that the movie and all episodes are on Disney+, Plus, it doesn't cost you any extra money, only time and possible mental and emotional well-being to watch the pilot movie. If you choose not to watch it, you can still follow the show fine. And, you know, and personally, I do quite like the, it's not quite a pilot, but the first episode of the first season is, is very, very good. And really, all, all of the season openers are really, really great. Uh, like, uh, yeah. And all of the season finales are also great. Uh, you know, there's a... Um, I, I guess I will just briefly, it's it's not a spoiler to say, some, some people were frustrated that, you know, season 6 and season 7 were, like, you know, season 6 was originally on Netflix, and season 7 was always on Disney+. Plus. You know, yeah, when it, when it premiered, it premiered on Disney+, Plus and has been on there ever since. The, um... Season 6 and Season 7, some people have said these were not really necessary. And I do think that if there wasn't an expectation of season length, those two seasons might have been shorter. It's basically like they do things that they wanted to do before completely saying goodbye to the show you know it's it's fine to you don't have to watch all of them you know basically like yeah you can you can stop watching at season 5 or season 6 or you can watch all of it including season 7 but the yeah you know it's it's probably a good thing you know if you do watch season 6 and 7 when you go into it don't expect that they are like you know, it's 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 episodes that they wanted to do that if the show had gotten more seasons, they probably wouldn't have been in the last two seasons. But, you know, it was stuff that they did want to do. They they apparently like straight up had and I'm not sure if they were like finished scripts, but they had like outlines lying around when the show moved and yeah. Now, that brings us to direction. Now, Dave Filoni did some really excellent episodes here. I'm really, really glad that he is still, you know, he still affects how, you know, new Star Wars, you know, like The Mandalorian. He has some, some hand in shaping that, for example. So, yeah, you know, really, really talented and like he gets how yeah he loves star wars he he has interesting stories to tell inside star wars so yeah obviously it's not a surprise that the bad guys take hits during firefights dogfights but good guys do as well although there is of course plot armor now episodes won't necessarily end on outright cliffhangers but most episodes you know yeah, you know, a lot of episodes do end in a way that will make you really badly want to watch the next one, which is, of course, very useful for a show that airs weekly rather than daily. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, in order to make the clone troopers sound like individuals, D. Bradley Baker recorded every voice separately and gave each one a different inflection. He liked to write down a particular adjective for each one. Some sound a bit younger, others a bit more proper. Another may sound like a bully or a grunt. During later seasons, he was able to record all of the voices in the same take. And, yeah, you know, they are d distinct individuals and, you know, given character development, which is really good because the moment that you have clones, especially as soldiers, it's easy to forget they're living beings and just consider them disposable. And, 
yeah, I really appreciate that. That was also a problem I had with the prequel trilogy that, like, you know, why are why are the good guys just faceless clones when this was, like, you know, the original trilogy of Star Wars is very much about the little guy, this kind of David versus Goliath thing, and then you make a massive force of soldiers that work, you know, at first for the the good guys, and there are just this faceless mass that just, yeah. And there's actually, there's one episode where Yoda knows the individual clones, and he makes the point, just because you have the same DNA doesn't mean you can't be different. You know, in the real world, clones do not exist, you know, right now. But some, human clones, I mean. But some people remain shocked that twins can be incredibly different from one another. And... Yeah, droids are still given personalities, can feel things like fear and pain, so it is kind of gross that we're encouraged to cheer and laugh as they get hurt. I wish they just made them universally evil, like Dooku Grievous and other villain characters. You know, let's see, it, the, the show doesn't have a lot of empathy for separatists. Some of them are just cartoon villains. I will grant that Bebop and Rocksteady are also frequently expressing fear and pain in the... Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1987, but, like, you know, un unlike Bebop and Rocksteady, the droids are dropping like flies. Like, Bebop and Rocksteady are most frustrated, sore, temporarily inconvenienced. I don't recall them even getting badly hurt. And, yeah, you know, on, on this show, like, we're supposed to, like, ah, uh, you know, that droid is, is screaming in, in pain as, you know, he lost a, a limb or something, which is, again, like, I thought the reason that the bad guys are droids is so that you can cut off heads and limbs without them feeling pain so we can get the, the cathartic thrill without the, the horrific implications, but, yeah. You know, and again, not only this show, also in... You know, not so much um, Phantom Menace. There's, you know, some of the droids might express confusion, but I'm not sure any of them ever, like, express pain or really fear. But in Attack of... Uh, I guess maybe not so much Attack of the Clones, but certainly Revenge of the Sith, which had come out before this show premiered. Let's see. I think on this show they needed to either change the approach to the personalities or not have a lot of droids be taken out. I personally vote for the former. You know, considering it does change a lot. Like, Anakin is very, very different here. Much more charming, less whiny and such. So they could have given the droids personality transplants as well. Now, let's see... Yeah, and, and, yeah, like Revenge of the Sith, you don't always feel like the good guys are in danger since the Jedi are so OP. And, like the movies, the designs are all very creative and distinct. Locations, aliens, vehicles, weapons, tech, you name it. You know, there's this separatist general that's like a spider, and, like, I'm not sure he always was, but at, you know... Yeah, I'm not sure he is from the start, but in later appearances, he's also part cyborg, and it's just the coolest freaking thing. It's so just, yeah. And, you know, you know how Mr. Burns does this? He does that with, like, the spider legs, and and you can see the, the hair on the spider legs, and he's got the little... Just absolutely... Mandibles are that, is, you know, mouth thing, and... He's got, ah, it's just, ah, he's just so, so, you just, ah, uh, get, get him off the screen. Stop him, Jedi, stop that guy, you know, and it's just, it's amazing. You know, this, this is the kind of thing that we want from Star Wars. And, yeah, even alien faces that aren't very humanoid are very expressive, so nothing is lost in that regard, which used to be the case for alien designs, sometimes on purpose, like the xenomorph. Even when the faces are, like, tiny and scrunched together, or really big and seemingly look the same all over, there's still some expression there. You know, there, there's some where it's just like, 
a tiny like the the mouth the the line of the mouth will go up or down it's just yeah absolutely amazing and the droids and the alien generals ruling them are sometimes designed to be real life creepy animals spiders squids very effective in making them instantly creepy and in some of the episodes the good guys will actually lose which i really respect appreciate and, you know, one episode says, if your leaders are telling you to do the wrong thing, even if it's what you're used to, you have a moral obligation to go against them. And the, the show can get very, like, episodic, very, uh, like, ah, crap, what's the word? There's a very specific word for, like... I'll have a moment. Anthology. Some, sometimes they're very much anthology episodes. Individual episodes generally doing genres and stories that they couldn't center the entire show. You know, there's horror stories with, like, mind control and viruses. You know, there's one episode where there's a political assassination leading to a murder mystery. I absolutely love it. These are probably my favorite episodes of the show. And just... Yeah, really, really appreciate the... Uh, did I really not... Okay, so yeah, it's just, yeah, from memory, there's there's one with, like... Uh, there's, a, there's at least one kaiju episode. There are zombies in, in at least one episode. You know, just some, some really, really... Yeah, there's, there's one that is straight up, like, noir, and you've got, like... The, the silhouettes and the, the way that the light comes in. Just, yeah, really, really amazing stuff. This features a non-zero amount of instances of clones that are child-aged, teenaged, firing guns, reminding us of the fact that these are groomed child soldiers. I appreciate their episodes that acknowledge how dirty politics sometimes get. And let's see. Yeah, so some of the show focuses more on character development and atmosphere than action. Yeah, I, I did know it's maybe the first two seasons have a lot of, of action. And later, you know, the, the show is never boring, but it's not always equally action-oriented. And sometimes it will be very much about, like, you know, let's, yeah, let's, let's examine these characters. Let's examine this moral quandary instead of just constant action, which I do also appreciate. While obviously I do not enjoy watching Jedi die, I do wish the show would either not have them survive so many ridiculous situations, or preferably not put them in so many situations that they shouldn't be able to survive. So I do appreciate that sometimes on the show Jedi do die. And the show adds depth to the characters we know in the movies, deepens the lore in ways that you can't do in the running time of movies. I think that the a lot of the best of the show is when it focuses on people, places, and situations we do not see in the prequel trilogy, even though this show is understandably beloved. I do think it is noteworthy that the various animated Star Wars shows that came after this are mostly, not exclusively, about characters, places, and situations not featured in the movies. And let's see. Yeah, there's there's at least one episode that you know I I remember whether or not it's more than one episode. I just don't want to give away whether it's an arc or a one-off for new viewers. But there's at least one episode that talks about slavery and it underlines the monstrous things that the slavers do to control slaves. It's completely clear it's a monstrous thing to do to other sentient beings, which. You know, sadly, like, there are Americans, including elected politicians, who still don't think that slavery was such a bad thing. And, yeah, I feel like this show can help, you know, encourage future generations to say, no, actually, slavery was bad. Now... I only watched the show recently. If you, like me, didn't get to it until now, then there are some characters, don't worry, I won't mention any names in this video, that we already know will survive this show because they appear in stuff that came out more recently and is set long after this, like The Mandalorian. But I assure you, the show is still really engaging, even when you know certain characters will survive. And... 
yeah, incredible variety. Sometimes you'll have a few people struggling to get to through tight claustrophobic caves. Other times you'll have countless people easily navigate wide open vistas. You know, it really takes advantage of all that you can do in the Star Wars galaxy, which is essentially limited only by budget and uh, and imagination. You know, so and you know they did not really spare any expense here, and there's a lot of imagination on display. You know, so yeah amazing and yeah there's this you know yeah if if you've watched the the prequels you already know about Coruscant the the city planet you know where and and in 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 some of this show we see that you have to traverse from the upper parts of Coruscant to the lower parts by basically hugging the side of this tall round building you know the the you know it's the kind of thing where it like it's it's basically you know it's like of uh, an unpleasant commute but it's the Star Wars version of it so it's not just driving you know in a long you know the in the same direction for a really long time but just driving slowly downwards or upwards depending on where exactly you know and Let's see. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense that Coruscant would build up, not only out, since there's, you know, they have to have space for, for this, you know, absurd amount of people. The Phantom Menace doesn't really have a Han Solo type, and, you know, the... the both Attack of the Clones and especially Revenge of the Sith did turn some of the Jedi major characters into Han Solo types, even though that's kind of a betrayal of what Jedi are characterized as in the original trilogy. This show does somewhat follow in those footsteps, but it does also feature characters that it makes more sense for them to be Han Solo types. You know, pirates, bounty hunters, etc. And yeah, this is definitely this is a very quip heavy show. If if you find the quipping in Revenge of the Sith to be to get grading, you may want to space out your viewing of, of episodes of the show. Or or like I don't know, I guess you could probably skip a lot of them the most quip heavy, but yeah, it's it's not my favorite aspect of the show. Let's go with that. And yeah, some you know some some episode uh, yeah a number of episodes in this show you know they they premiered out of chronological order. Some people absolutely hate this. Personally, I think it's not that big of a problem. It certainly is a sor potential source of frustration because with a number of episodes, you can't immediately tell when they're set. At times, you might even miss that it's not set at the same time as the episode right before and or after. You know, fortunately, if you are watching this on a Windows computer, there is a solution. Use Google Chrome, download and activate the extension that puts them in order. Now, let's see. You know, I, I did test it myself, so I can confirm that it works. I did end up changing my mind and just watching them in order. Uh, you know, but yeah. But, but it is definitely, you know, if you choose not to do that, just pay very close attention to the, the because there's at least one where it's just, you know, okay, so here's some, here's some clone troopers that are in a location that we've seen before, but a character that we saw in those other episodes isn't there, and in that episode it seemed like, oh, okay, they, they won, they don't need to go back there, I... You know, I didn't realize at first. Oh, okay, this is set before. I I thought that the uh, I, I don't know. I guess there's some reason they went back there. Now, let's see. and and definitely, you know, if you watch this when it originally premiered, you there was nothing you could do about that. You know, so that yeah, I I think. I kind of wish that they would just have had just like a brief, I don't know if clip, yeah, yeah, just a very brief clip from the the other, you know, or just a, yeah, just a brief mention, like in the example I just gave, just have one of the clones, 
or wait, do they? Actually, they might have, and I just missed it. But anyway, just, I think they could have done at least a little bit more to make it completely clear where it's set if it's not, you know, taking place right after the episode before it. Or at the very least, after. Yeah, not necessarily, not, it doesn't have to be right after, but when you're jumping back and forth in time. Uh, yeah. So, let's see. Yeah, one, one critic said some of the performances, like Anakin and Ahsoka Tano, started out not great, but they get much better over the course of Season 1. Very true. As someone who prefers when voice work goes to voice actors, many of whom work for a very long time and have to take any work they can get, rather than big Hollywood names who can pick and choose when it comes to voice work, really happy that they cast voice actors and they are giving very strong performances. And their characterization and interpersonal relationships are better, much more complex and appealing here than in the prequels. In general, the show is a lot better than the prequels. One thing is, you know, I don't love the relationship between Anakin and Padme, although that's also a problem in the movies, but there are a couple of times where they make that very annoying here, but, yeah. Matt Lanter plays Anakin Skywalker, and... Let's see, the... Yeah, he does a really, really great job. I don't know why they made Anakin look so square-jawed. He, do jawed. he doesn't look very that much like Hayden Christensen. He really is one of the only ones to not look like his live-action counterpart. I mean, Hayden Christensen is conventionally attractive, so it's not that. He looks like an action figure, like a, or a 90s Hollywood action lead or something. It's, yeah, I, I felt like it was very unnecessary. I, he already looks badass in the, the prequel movies, so. And, let's see. Yeah. Uh, Ashley Eckstein. Eckstein. Eckstein plays Ahsoka Tano, and I gotta say, something that bothers me is that, you know, at the start, she is supposed to be 14 years old, and, you know, she's coded as not being white, and she's heavily sexualized. It's an old racist trope that non-white women are inherently more sexual than white women, it's true that a lot of the following is also the case with the blue female Jedi in the prequel movies, but it's not as big of a problem since, you know, she isn't a main character. Ahsoka Tano is one of the, the main characters. She wears a tube top, and I know some people would say a skirt. That's not a skirt. It's a belt. As such, a lot of her skin is bare, not only her face and neck, which is also true of the male Jedi, also her midriff, legs, arms, and in addition, in addition, her eyes and lips are very large and pronounced. And this is, like, she's in war zones. Why is she not covering more, like, you, you'd think that they would be, like, you know, not, not like heavy armor, but you would, yeah, you'd figure that they would want to, to, to you know, or at the very least, the Jedi robes that the male Jedi wear, you know. And there are episodes where she is more fully dressed, so I don't know why they didn't just do that all of the time. Now, she is the, the character that the young audience is supposed to most identify with, so it's no surprise that she starts out very irritating. Think X-Men 97's Jubilee. Think Wesley on Star Trek The Next Generation. You know, yeah. She does get a lot better. And also, in a lot of old reviews, people would make jokes about how she was premenstrual because apparently women should feel shame for that. That's the kind of thinking that worsens period poverty. Let's see. Yeah, some of the problems with the prequels are fixed for this. Unfortunately, some are worsened. And one of the things that gets some of both improvement and worsening is the racism. James Arnold Taylor plays Obi-Wan Kenobi, and yeah, the, the bickering between Anakin and Obi-Wan is much less annoying than in the, the prequels, and let's see, yeah, and Tom Kane performs as the narrator who explains the film's event, yeah, the, of, of the, yeah, every, you know, the, the movie 
the pilot movie and each episode most episodes open with him explaining you know this is the specific situation for this corner of the war he also plays Yoda. wow yeah the same guy plays the narrator and Yoda he does a really great job they don't sound the same yeah And, yeah, I already mentioned, but it bears repeating, D. Bradley Baker, you know, plays the, the clone troopers and just does such a phenomenal job. And, right, in the, in the pilot movie, Christopher Lee, R.I.P., reprises his role from the movies as Count Dooku, son of Lord and Lady Poopy. And, yeah, in the movie, Samuel Jackson reprises his role as Mace Windu. And Terence C. Carson in the show. And yeah, Anthony Daniels voices C-3PO, at least in the movie. I forget if also in the, in the show. Um, let's see. And yeah, Nika Futterman play, uh, yeah, Asajj Ventress, who, yeah, now spoilers, a, a Sith assassin who is just so badass. Like, I really, really love when they let women be badass in these. And it's also really cool, like, you know, so she is one of the bad guys. Sometimes her violence will be very gendered. Like, the the at, at one point she tells one of her enemies, who's a man, there is nothing that you could give me, or, or there's nothing I want from you. You know, uh, which which is, like... A lot of straight men cannot bear to hear that from a woman that they might be attracted to, you know. So, and the, the just, yeah, you know, they play up this trope of women being sort of duplicitous. And, you know, she has this kind of snake-like quality, you know. And, you know, if it was just put you know, made out to be bad, I would definitely have a problem with it. But she actually gets to be cool, and she gets to be, you know, it's it's evil, but in a feminine way. Because the, the male evil characters get to be evil in a very masculine way. They have deep voices. They, they, they tend to attack directly straight on, and, you know, they will... Yeah, you know, there's even, like, machismo... Uh, although I do love when when Dooku says, well, well, yeah, some yeah, some of it I absolutely love. But well, yeah, for example, when Count Dooku says, "Master Obi Wan, you disappoint me. Master Yoda holds you in such high esteem. Surely you can do better." You know, that's the kind of thing a guy says to another guy to to get them to you know to to try to mess with their head. You know, where. Massage will say, there is nothing you could give me. You know, just, yeah, absolutely love the, yeah. And Ian Abercrombie, Ian McDermott, and ah, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. I will have it momentarily. Um, real? Hmm. Um, right. Tim Curry play Chancellor Chancellor Palpatine and Darth Sidious, and Catherine Te Teber plays Padme Amidala, and she does a phenomenal like, you know, I I feel like it's almost an insult to. She does really great acting. In addition to this. Spot on impersonation. Like, if I didn't, if I didn't know, if I couldn't, if I couldn't look it up online, if this was a, if we were living in a pre-internet age, and I heard the voice performance, I would be like, how did they get Natalie Portman to voice the character for all of this show? You know, just amazing. She she really must have studied. Natalie Portman's voice very carefully because the you know she has a very distinct voice. It's a yeah, just really really impressive. 
And yeah, you know, like in the movies, Padme gets to go full action hero. And let's see. Yeah, and this show has both her and clones do the following. So honestly, I thought it was only Jedi who could like kick battle droids and, and punch them and such without breaking bones and so like I kind of assumed that the Jedi were like using the force to protect their feet like that famous example of Luke Skywalker using a force kick because wow did that kick not at all connect in Return of the Jedi but that, you know that's what we that's what we tell ourselves and I, I personally, I think that's perfectly fine. You know, there's a lot of movies that couldn't get away with that kind of thing. But yeah, he's using the Force, whatever. If he, if he can push using his hand, why can't he also, like, make his kick hit further than his foot goes? But yeah, apparently, according to the show, it is possible to just kick and punch droids to the point where you, like, you know break their legs? Is it called that when they don't have bones to break? I guess they have joints. And let's see. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just gotta mention there is at least one episode that I found very, very frustrating where the writing for Padme borders on character assassination. First, she's upset with Anakin for putting the war ahead of the two of them spending time together when in Attack of the Clones she's specifically choosing a relationship with him even though she knows that their respective jobs will put a strain on that, he's an important general. They spend a lot of their shared screen time bickering like an old married couple. Let's see. And she, you know, she does still think that she should, you know, do important stuff for the, you know, but Anakin doesn't, which is, you know, that is accurate to his character. That's where the character assassination ends. I realized that kind of thing was prominent in movies from the age that inspired the original Star Wars trilogy and a number of the things in the prequel movies. But while I do have issues with how gender-specific, bordering on sexist Padme is written in the first two prequels and how bad it gets in Revenge of the Sith, which uh, is a whole nother thing, it was rarely this bad. Now, let's see. Right, and yeah, Corey Burton plays... Oh, he also played Count Dooku. Yeah, uh, Cad Bane, which is just, you know... Yeah, you, at me mentioning his name, you either went... Who? I don't remember him being in Star Wars before this. Or you went, oh yeah, that guy's so cool. Because literally everyone loves. He's just, he's such a badass. And just, yeah. Um, Bounty Hunter... A lot of cool gadgets, just the voice, the the kind of, and he's got like a, a, a what's it called, wide rimmed hat. Like he walked right out of a western, and I am here for it. And oh, right, we meet other members of the Hut Clan. I guess, yeah. I will just briefly mention, you know, some people really hate the character Zero the Hut. He basically, like, he talks and the basic, also just like, yeah, the, the way he, yeah, gesticulates and, and various, you know, he's basically Truman Capote. He is, he is just like Truman Capote in the way that, you know, yeah, there are some things in the, in the, you know, the, yeah, the way that, you know, the the Imperial troopers are called stormtroopers, just like the German, the, the Nazi soldiers were, you know, so, yeah, just straight up they took, and, yeah, you know, like, Truman Capote was a big deal when George Lucas was young. I liked Zero the Hut fine, like, maybe it helps that I loved Truman Capote as Lionel Twain in Murder by Death, but, yeah, um... But, but yeah, if, you know, yeah. I don't think I have to detail what Truman Capote, you know, yeah. You, you either know or you can definitely find, like, clips of it 
he had a very certain way of of speaking and you know he wasn't like from what i understand truman capote wasn't trying to be offensive that was just what came naturally to him you know he was just being himself and yeah like zero is not you know we've met really really awful huts before so the you know i mean technically the 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 you know java there's some like fat phobia going on there so you know it's it's not really a surprise that a hut is is offensive in some way i don't think zero is supposed to be like making fun of lgbtq people with his voice and mannerisms i think it is just you know oh look at remember truman capote kind of thing that's that's how it reads to me they they don't because it is it is just like truman capote you know and sure if that's you know if you're not used to that or that bothers you yeah it's going to bother you in this show and let's see yeah and kevin michael richardson as jabba and matthew wood as General Grievous with his cookie monster voice. And yeah. Um uh, do I wanna Yeah, yeah. Um Katie Sackoff plays Bo Katan Kreez and you know I I've I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you you know, you know it's a good day if you're watching Katie Sackhoff in serialized science fiction. You know, that's a, that's, yes, more please. And I feel like that might be a spoiler. I'll, I'll just say that some very beloved characters reappear in this and are made more interesting. Ahmed Best and also BJ Hughes play Jar Jar Binks and yeah, uh, made worse in in some uh, respects. Sometimes, uh, you know, at least slightly better, but they do kind of. He's he's frequently as bad as he was in the Phantom Menace when like George Lucas intentionally toned him down a lot for Attack of the Clones. So, and he's also in this much more than. Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. So yeah, I won't say who he plays, but Sam Witwer does phenomenal work here. So does Clancy Brown. Ah, uh, you know what? I I will go ahead and and say that Clancy Brown plays a character called Savage Opress, who comes from the same people as Darth Maul, and just so freaking good to see more of, of the, yeah. Um, let's see. Jim Cummings as Hondo Anaka, also absolutely, just, yeah. Um, whenever you realize Hondo's in an episode, you know it's going to be a good one. He is, I guess, he's basically like a, a pirate lord, and he's just, like, there's this kind of shamelessness, but also a kind of charm. Like, he can't kill his way out of every situation. He might like to, but he can't. So sometimes he has to talk his way out of things. And just, yeah, it's it's very, very fun. And Olivia Dabo plays Luminara Unduli. Nothing sexist in the writing of her. I very much approve. Ben Diskin as Walk 47 and Ozzy 3, which are... Basically, like, comedy droids, but, yeah, that's also very Star Wars. We've been there right from the start, you know, and, yeah, they have personality. They're not boring. Robin Atkin Downs is here and great as usual. Um, yeah, one of the characters he plays is Rush Clovis, who had a relationship with pop, or maybe they were just attracted to each other. I, I, yeah, I think they were just attracted to each other. You know, and 
that causes some friction between her and Anakin, which, yeah, so either skip that or be ready for that. Uh, see, right, uh, Gideon Emery as Lot Dawn and Medici, and John Favreau as Pre Vizsla, which, you know, he also has a very distinct voice, so that was very interesting with the first time you heard his voice coming out of a, a character. But yeah, um, you know, these days we think of, we, we probably think, it, yeah, you know, he's, he's the big Disney director, you know, he's, but he can still act. He's still very, very, you know, he started as an actor in, in the business and yeah. And, and actually, you know, the character isn't particularly comedic, but he does very solid dramatic acting. You know, it's, uh, he has done other dramatic acting. I, I, I feel like I heard that Chef is completely dramatic acting, but yeah, you know, you could understand if he would be like, oh, can we please make him funny? I'm, I'm the funny guy, you know, but which, you know, like that goes back a while. He's been, you know, very, very funny in a lot of stuff in, you know, anyway. See and right, and Dave Filoni himself plays Embo and additional voices. Right, I have a couple of more things about Massage Ventress. Very creepy and intense. Brian George plays Kiari Mundi. He still hasn't put any pants pants on that obscene thing. King Katunko. Right, Barbara Goodson plays Mother Tolson, who's basically like this witch and just yeah they do some really really great stuff with again like very very gender specific you know there's a you know the the evil women on the show you know sometimes have more of a connection to nature and they use these mystical things you know like there's always been magic in star wars but the Force, you know, can be good or bad. This witchcraft stuff is clearly like, ah, oh, you know, that's messed up. Really, really. So, yeah. And Anna Graves plays Duchess Satine Kreez, Sugimina Tills, and additional. And let's see. Yeah, I found it kind of frustrating and borderline sexist the characterization for Satine and sometimes also Padme to these writers, you know, even when in danger, these women care about their romantic feelings while the men manage to focus on the danger. When the men bring up the possibility of straight romance to other men, it's to be annoying, very stereotypical gender roles. They could easily have the men focus a lot on the romance as well and be accepting when bringing it up to each other. But yeah, you know, Satine, like Padme, peaceful by trade, philosophy, and disposition, but willing to engage in some violence if it's in the name of ending violence, and both of them are good shots, so the show both has female Jedi being as capable as male Jedi, and female civilians who are still willing to fight, sending the message to girls and young women that even if they're not complete badasses, which is of course an option for them, they can still be important in other ways, even other violent ways. Jennifer Hale plays Ayla Secura and Ryo Chuchi. I can't help but notice that in a lot of her uh, Ayla Secura's appearances on this show, her cleavage is visible in almost every shot she's in, including a lot of the close-ups on her face. I do appreciate that she does get personality now. I don't think she even had a single line in the prequels, and I didn't know her name until watching the show, even though I've watched the prequels quite a few times. So, yeah, I have some issues with the sexism and with Ahsoka racism for a lot. I, yeah, most of the, the major female characters. And I do still think there are too fem few female Jedi. Like, some of the defining traits of Jedi is that they have to use their emotions, find nonviolent solutions to problems. Those traits here in the West are seen as more feminine than masculine. So, logically, there should be more female Jedi than male. And the fact that there isn't really points to... Uh, you know, an unwillingness on a lot of young men to see women in these kinds of roles. And Tom Kenny also does some great work. Newt Gunray, Tandivo, Greedo. 
Right, Jim King plays Orisei. Yeah, she she does phenomenal. Like I has she even done other voice work? Like, you know, when I think Jim King, like I primarily think stuff like Sin City, you know, The Spirit where she, you know, it's a bad movie, but she's good in it. But yeah, she does a phenomenal job in in this. Um, yeah, just, you know, you you wouldn't have guessed that she wasn't a voice actor. And Phil Lamar plays Bail Organa, Kit Fisto, Orn Frita, and additional. And Kit Fisto again, like. He's in the movies, but I didn't even know his name before watching the show. But here, you know, he gets he gets personality, lines, and such. He's another Jamaican stereotype, but he's much more subdued than Jar Jar Binks, and not really painted in negative light at all. He's a great Jedi Master. This is how you do it. It's not wrong to base a prominent character, or any character, on real-life ethnicity, as long as you do it respectfully. And... Ah, uh, I guess, yeah, Daniel Logan plays some clone cadets, which is very cool. Um, yeah, if you don't recognize his name, I don't know that, is he known for much of anything else? But yeah, he did play young Boba Fett, baby Boba, in Attack of the Clones. And... Let's see, Ooh, right, and yeah, Angelique Perrin as... Adia Galia and additional voices. I quite like Galia. She's clearly coded as an African American woman. She isn't stereotyped as being overly emotional and aggressive as so many black women in American media unfairly are. It's a way to avoid having to listen to them when they point out problems. It's completely untrue that they are more that than white people. Let's see. And I think think that might be about... Right, a Meredith Selinger as Barris Offey is also great. And, um, I gotta just double check. But that is the... Yes, yes, Barris Offey, you know, she... A, a, you know, she, she was a Padawan under Luminara Unduli, and... She, you know, she was alongside Ahsoka Tano some of the time, and there is this great, like, they have slightly different perceptions because of their their masters, in, in part. And, yeah, absolutely great. Let's see that. Um, right, right. Uh, Tessia Valenza as Shakti, also... Ah, crap. I'm not always great with the name, so I'm just going to make sure that I'm... Uh, Shakti. She is the... Oh, there's more than one Shakti. Right, that's where they got the name, isn't it? Um, yes, she... Yeah, she does appear in the, in the movies, at least briefly. She looks a lot like Ahsoka Tano, and again, you know... Yeah, she's you know female Jedi, and she's they they don't make her out to be a worse Jedi than the men, and she also isn't like hypersexualized. She's wearing a Jedi robe, at least in the pictures there, and as far as I recall, also in the show. Um, let's see. Does that? Uh, no, I feel like that's a spoiler. Oh, right, right. Um, Mark Hamill does lend his voice to at least one character. Really, really cool. And... Let's see... Oh, right, and David Tennant voices... Oh, ah, crap. How did they pronounce it? Huang? Huang? I, I forget, but he was also really, really great. And just, yeah, I mean, David Tennant, um, after watching Jessica Jones, I could watch David Tennant 
in anything and everything like the the just so amazing so so yeah right uh yeah misplaced these notes but yes yeah, some more about jar jar binks yeah despite it being set after attack the clones he is as clumsy as he is in phantom menace which is sometimes useful but always racist against jamaicans and in general you know darker skinned people and but yeah you know so there's some diversity in casting and it does actually go to to try to understand the you know they're not they're not worse than the white characters and the male characters and such and such but there are some ways in which they are maybe different and that shapes their perspective it doesn't mean that they can't do well they can't you know some some people think that oh they must not be able to do their job well but no they they are good at their jobs but they you know so so young viewers of this can you know there's there's some chance they'll be able to see themselves in one of the the characters that is shown to be capable and it can encourage them to actually you know yeah to to try to pursue their dreams <clears throat> Now, let's see. Yeah, some people really hate the, the dialogue, at least in early seasons, but yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, early on there's some issues, but it gets a lot better after the first few seasons. And... Yeah, so cinematography is, you know, it's basically handled by the animators. But yeah, great camera movement, angles, lighting. Some episodes use high angles and far shots to create a sense of threat and surveillance. And there is at least one episode that's basically a noir murder mystery. They really nailed it in every respect. One of the main ones is the visuals, silhouettes, shadowy lighting, the kind of window curtain that lends in bars of light. Just, yeah. Which brings us to the editing, which is also solid. Like, they did a really good job trimming out. Like, it, I'm not sure it happened in the editing process. They probably tried to do this before they animated stuff. But, you know, they the show manages to avoid... Like, for example, if there are characters that are going to discuss a plan, you won't necessarily have to sit and watch them talk about the plan. It'll just go to them carrying out the plan because you're gonna see the plan you know if you like if they follow the plan you're gonna see the plan so you don't need it explained before unless it's like if it's very very complex they might go go over it but you know that's just one example there's a lot of stuff like that where yeah they they tend to avoid and it's also you know a number of the characters have met before the show starts you know, there are some that will meet and you'll have like, oh, that's the first impression they got and kind of thing. But for a bunch of them, you know, and it's also, you know, the show assumes that you know what a Jedi is, that you know, uh, that you understand the, the basics of the war. So they're not, you know, hand-holding you through that, which again would just be annoying because you can't watch this. You won't be able to follow this if you didn't watch Attack of the Clones and probably also Revenge of the Sith, but so, well, yeah, yeah, got it backwards. If you didn't watch The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones before this, you will simply be lost. And no, you can't even, you know, it's not enough to watch The Phantom Menace because the war hasn't started by the end of that one, and you can't skip ahead until Attack of the Clones because there's some really important stuff in The Phantom Menace that just, you know, you're not gonna have any clue who Jar Jar is, if and and why people keep him around in this show. If you didn't watch the Phantom Menace, so yeah, and yeah, so animation, you know, even though it came out so soon after the 2007 Beowulf film, unlike that, this doesn't have 
dead eyes on organic characters. Obviously, none of the droids have them. Actually, yeah, I, I guess I... Yeah, that's that's a... I, I did mention about the alien faces and such. Droids, you know, they also... <clears throat> sometimes, they will be very, like, straightforward, and they don't necessarily have a lot of personality, so it's just... So, so there's not a lot of expression in the face because it's not really necessary but others are you know yeah they they make sure that there is something that they can use to to express some emotion or the the design itself will be very evocative like some droids are clearly built to intimidate some are built to ease you know the the you know and and it does point out you know some people would think oh droids are just bad there are good droids as well. And yeah, some of the designs make me think of Psychonauts 1. I haven't played 2 yet. I want to. And that's a great thing. And yeah, I um yeah, so so this yeah, some critic quotes on the animation. Like one giant moving oil painting, it's beautiful. It feels like 3D version of the Jendi Tartakovsky show, which is very true and great choice. Yeah. And yeah, so let's see. Uh, yeah, the character design. Well, Lucas is on record as wanting to look reminiscent of Jap Japanese anime and the Super Mario Nation of Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, by way of review. Anime is designed to use flash and visual impact to disguise the reduced number of frames per second of the animation, frames per second determining the smoothness of an animated figure's motions. Super Mario Nation is basically the stringed puppets brought to life and more or less enchanting the pants off a select, not a lucky group of kids. Any possible appeal it possesses comes from the brassy music score. You often didn't know whether to listen or march to music and the solid, incredibly detailed sets the marionades pretended to walk on. Combining anime with Super Mario Nation successfully combines the worst of both worlds. The clunkiness of anime, usually hidden by quick editing, various musical and visual punctuations, bursting lights, wind ruffled hair, blurring music, and the woodenness of marionettes. So that is a very harsh description of it. I and and it's important to note this was from a review of the movie, not the show. I I think there's definitely some truth to that, and it is an interesting perspective. I I if I hadn't read that, I wouldn't have realized all that stuff, but it gets much much better and it really isn't as bad as that makes it sound but you know you can you can just watch like the first little chunk of the movie and if it's not appealing to you just stop and just go to the first episode or you know wherever you decide to start but don't let that harsh description talk you out of watching the show at all and yeah so um there's some really great, like, they do a really great job of rendering, like, large battles and personal, like, there's some really amazing lightsaber action on this show, you know. In, in general, I would probably say the, I, I prefer the action on this show to the action of Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. I do think there's some really great action in The Phantom Menace, but... Yeah, it, often the show tops it. And... Right, so yeah. Um, the action features chases on foot and in vehicles. Lightsaber action, plentiful. There is logically enough like the prequel trilogy, not original or sequel trilogy. But there is also a lot of variety. Bounty hunter action with gadgets, physical fights, martial arts, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles use of superpowers, superpower items, equipment and vehicles. There's a lot of action in it's especially early in the show, but really yeah, it it's it doesn't keep being like non-stop action after I think it was maybe I think season 3 was when it started being more atmosphere and character examination, but there is action in all 7 seasons. And, yeah, well choreographed, very lots of tension and suspense, fast-paced. You know, the, when this, when the first five seasons originally aired on, 
I'm gonna make absolutely sure I have this right so I don't sound like a complete nincompoop. Cartoon Network. When the first five seasons were on Cartoon Network, you know, every seven minutes there's gonna be a commercial break. They want people to wait through that to see what happens next in the episode. So, yeah, there's some that increases the, the pace. A lot of the battles are very brief compared to the movies. Many do involve dozens of fighters, sometimes hundreds, whether on foot, in vehicles, or the like. There's a lot of guerrilla combat, which has, of course, always been a huge part of Star Wars. And when the source of danger is very different from what we're used to, the show will set up the source of danger before it comes relevant, rather than just last minute. And not only the good guys, but also the bad guys fight with smart tactics, which is, of course, harder to choreograph, but also much more satisfying both to choreograph and to watch. Now, some people, well, at least one critic said, too much pointless action where the status quo isn't really changed. It's Flash. I th maybe in the first two seasons, yes. I, I think there's a, a strong case to, to be made for that, but I wouldn't really say that of the later ones. Now, the music was handled by, uh, did I, I, I'm going to really quick see if I can find a, because I heard someone pronounce his name, but I don't remember exactly, ah, uh, um, okay, one more try, there we go, how do you pronounce Um, okay, so, Kevin Kiner, that sounds familiar, yes, Kevin Kiner, I think I thought it was Kinnear, but yeah, Kevin Kiner composed the score for this, he has 93 credits for TV in total as composer, and just, he does an amazing job here. Um, and this is not the only animated Star Wars he has scored for. They brought him back, which makes a lot of sense. On YouTube, there is a playlist. Here on YouTube, there is a playlist of 283 pieces of music from this show. So that gives you an idea of, yeah, they, they, there's a, there's a variety of, because it, it takes you all over the Star Wars galaxy. And uh, let's see. Yeah, on according to Wikipedia, on April 8th, 2007, Any Cool News reported that musician Eric Riggler had recorded music for the series. Riggler disclosed that each planet in the Star Wars galaxy would have its own theme music. The episode uh, Riggler performed on was based on Bulgarian music played on with Julian Pipes and Kevin kind of composed the original score for each episode. So yeah. Each planet has its own theme music, and it really, like, you know, music has always been a huge part of Star Wars. You know, the in the original, <clears throat> basically, I, I want to say it was Lucas who, who felt that because we can't relate to what we're seeing, the music has to tell us how to, how to feel. Like, there's a couple of things, you know, you can recognize Luke, okay, that's, that's a teenager who really wants to get away from the situation but you know he's stuck in the you know but the the music has to get across things that <clears throat> because we can't just we can't always depend on contact and yeah they they do a really solid job in this show as well and yeah amazing sound design you know it's animated, so all of the audio had to be created. They're not walking around on sets handling props that give off noise. And, yeah, like, this is the kind of thing where I never... No, yeah, no, there, there wasn't really any instance in this where I just felt like, okay, that has the wrong sound for that kind of thing. And... Let's see, that is... Yeah, that brings us to, so the, the best element, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a tie, the best elements 
of this show, in my opinion. The exploration of, com of the complexity of war, the way that it communicates these really important, you know, topics in a way that younger audiences can understand, and yeah, you know, more diversity, more and, and more positive diversity for, you know, again, Star Wars, there's always been some diversity. I'll, I'll grant in the original, it's like more like diversity of background. There's, you know, it's mostly white people and there's only the one woman in the first movie, but yeah, the, the, um, the, the, um, right on the tip of my tongue, I swear. You know, now, now there is more, you know, not, not necessarily quite regular racial diversity, but there are characters that are coded as not being white that are more positive. You know, there were characters that were coded as not white, such as Jamaican Jar Jar in the movies, but that was a largely negative depiction. Now, yeah, uh, the worst aspect, you know, as good as this is, it is connected to the prequels. You know, the this is an amazing show, but you can't really watch this independently from them. You know, honestly, like, um, it would be kind of cool if someone tried. I, I, um, yeah, but I, I just, I think they would have so many questions that, uh, yeah. But, but yeah, ultimately, I don't think it's a big deal. Like, you know, if you, if you love the original trilogy, like, maybe, maybe, like, sit down with some friends, maybe, like, have some, some beer, maybe, maybe watch it with riff tracks or something, but, yeah, see if you can get your, yourself through the, the, the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, and then watch at least some of this show, because it's just so so freaking good and you know it helps that they're now also you know part of the reason that I started watching this now was that they're actually following up on you know there's there's stuff that appears in this show that's followed up on in some of the more recent Disney Plus Star Wars stuff so yeah and I'm really really glad that I now have more background for those things now, the, um, yeah, so one, one complaint that I found, you know, some people thought that the show was too child-oriented, and I, I get what they mean, and there's definitely, there's a couple of things where that really bothers me. I, I wish there wasn't as much bickering, for example, and there are times where they'll have something really dark and then contrasted with something that's like, meant to be funny but it's like wow you just went super dark now you now you think we can laugh like right after that and just yeah i'm not that i don't think that always works but i you know this is this is much more mature than you know i i realize it's super dated but i haven't watched a lot of saturday morning cartoon shows you know in in recent years and i'm only watching this because star wars you know but yeah, this is much more mature than the 1987 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show. Um, I think it is more mature than the the Sonic one, you know, Blue Streak Speaks by Sonic the Hedgehog, that one. I, I haven't watched that one for, I don't know, 20 years, probably more, so I'm not certain, but... Um, and it does... Uh, yeah, this and the 97 X-Men both have a lot of mature, uh, you know, there's there's exploration of, of mature themes. Not, not like, oh, you know, sex, but like, okay, this is actually a complex topic. This is not a black and white thing, that kind of thing, you know. The thing I was most worried about was, you know, cringe content and really there's very little of that I in in my opinion I I know some people felt that there was some really really bad stuff um 
yeah, I would I would say if you at least you know, maybe you don't want to start with season one, maybe not even season two, but like if you try to watch at least some of season three, and then if you feel like it's just not for you, yeah, maybe it maybe it just won't be. You know, that's that's too bad, but it's not for everyone. Um, but yeah, the you know, I was uh, I guess that okay. I will not be naming names, so I will just say the thing I was most looking forward to was there is a there is at least one character in this show that I knew was a beloved character and at least one character on this show that I knew would appear I'm not gonna say whether I'm talking about the same character the moment that I said fan favorite I realized oh wow a lot of people are gonna know exactly what I'm talking about aren't they but there's at least one character on this show that I knew was going to be in later you know actually yeah I've already seen some of the episodes that they've appeared in so yeah, I, you know, I was looking forward to seeing why people love this character so much that they would be brought back this long after, and I get it. And um, I may have already said this, but yeah, um, every every season, whether we're talking about the opener, the finale, the overall season, I love all of them. There are no episodes that I just felt like, okay, that was pointless. I mean, I can see, like, I've seen some people say that certain arcs go on for longer than needed, but I didn't, I never felt like they, the show was really, almost never felt like the show was just wasting time or, or like, treading water or something. Now, which, you know, comparatively, like, I certainly remember some episodes of the 1987 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles where it was just like, okay, you made this to sell toys. This is a toy advert. Now, some of the trailers do give a little too much away, but they do also give you a good idea of what the show is like. And some of the cover poster art do give also give too much weight but again give you a good idea of what it's like so the yeah uh, Rotten Tomatoes the movie itself has an 18 percent from critics uh, 171 reviews only 31 fresh and the and a 40 percent from the audience based on over a hundred thousand ratings the critics said that Mechanical animation and less than stellar script make the Clone Wars a pale shadow of George Lucas' once great franchise. Uh, I apparently forgot to copy in. Okay, I will have it momentarily. The show itself has a 93% from on the tomato meter, or the yeah, average tomato meter of the seasons, and the average audience score is 91%. Now the individual ones, season one has a 69. Nice. Uh, let's see, season two had, it, I guess, too few reviews to say. Season three has 100%, and so do seasons five, six, and seven. Now, when it comes to user score, season one has 78, season two has 87, season three has 93. Season 4 has 95, Season 5 has 96, Season 6 has 95, and Season 7 has 95 also. So yeah, um, very positively received. And on Metacritic, the movie itself has 35 out of 100 based on 30 critic reviews, and a 5.6 user score. Now the move the show has a 66 out of 100 based on 12 critic reviews and a 9.0 from users. So, yeah. Now the let's see did I come? There we go. Yes. The movie on IMDb has 5.9 out of 10. And yeah, um 23.8% gave it 6, which makes a lot of sense. And there were 
let's see. Yeah, of, of user reviews, the movie has 304 or 225 without spoilers, and the show has 349 or 276 without spoilers. And I, th uh, let's see, I read the for the for the show itself. I read the top voted 100, I guess without spoilers. And let's see. Yeah, and, and the movie, yeah, the IMDb external reviews section, I could, the, um, let's see, 80 of the 213 links for the movie and 42 of the 71 for the show links were in English and not dead links. Now, the show, oh, right, right, yeah, and the, yeah, um, the movie was nominated for a Razzie, worst prequel, remake, ripoff, or sequel, which... Of 2009, I mean, 2009, wasn't that all also the second Transformers movie? I hear that one's terrible, so maybe that one was the winner. Anyway, the show has an 8.4 out of 10 based on 94,287 IMDb user votes. 31% gave it 10, 21.1 gave it 10, 21, 25.19, 25.5% gave it 8, 10.3% gave it 7, 3.4 gave it 6, 1.6 gave it 1, huh. 1.5 gave it 5, 0 0.7 gave it 4, 0 0.5 gave it 3, 0 0.4 gave it 2. And yeah, it won 27 awards and was nominated for a total of 74. So I'm not going to go over all of them. I am just going to let's see. I'm I'm yes. Um D. Bradley Baker won or, uh, nomin was nominated. For playing the clone troopers, and Nika Furman for playing Asajj Ventress. The editing was nominated. Uh, Kevin Kiner was nominated for at least one episode, and yeah, a bunch of the voice acting in general was nominated, including Mark Hamill's and Jim King's. So yeah as well as a lot of the, the main cast. Um, okay, this is a long list. So, um, yeah. Very, very positively received. Yeah, Sam Whitworth did actually win for his role, and that makes a lot of sense. He's amazing in it. And, yeah, so the, um, there is violence in this, you know, people are shot and clearly die, they don't, you know, it's not one of those really family-friendly things, but there's relatively little, at least human blood, and, uh, yeah, you know, um, there are implications of like sexual things, but it doesn't get into, you know, yeah, um, and and a lot of it will fly right over the the kids' heads unless their reflexes are too fast, in which case they would catch it. And the let's see, yeah, there there doesn't really tend to be like offensive language, uh, yeah. And, yeah, um, there aren't any extras on Disney+. Plus. Um, you know, if you want extras, you're going to have to buy the, the season sets. I guess that's where their head is at. That's probably the decision there. Because, you know, comparatively, like, most MCU movies have good stuff, and some of them have a lot of stuff. So, but, yeah. Um, I guess... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I rate this 10 anim incredible animated Star Wars shows out of 10. 
I'm not saying everything's perfect, but the strengths so greatly outweigh the weaknesses. Um, yeah, it's rare for me to rewatch shows, but I wouldn't rule out rewatching maybe even later today, even though I'm also going to be watching Rebels. But yeah, uh, the show absolutely holds up. You know, there's there's some stuff from like the mid to late 2000s where you go back and watch it and it's like, wow, what were we on? But this is not one of those. And yeah, I think, you know, and this is almost definitely the plan because Disney likes making money. This is a show that people will, you know, it will get new viewers as Disney Plus you know, produces more stuff that is following up on events and characters in this. And, yeah, so the... I... Yes, this is the end of the video, so hit me up in the comments, let me know what is your favorite arc. What's your favorite character? What do you, what in this show do you hope they will follow up on? What's your favorite thing that they did all, already follow up on? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. This is just a video for the watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MC that ah, Disney Plus Star Wars show, live action Star Wars show, which these days is the Mandalorian. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, th one of the one of the links, I think it will be both on screen, but also in the description box. I link to my, you know, Star Wars vlog playlist. I have vlogged about all 11 of the movies, a couple of the games, and, yeah, you know, basically everything of the shows that I've watched so far. So, you know, all the, yeah, all the live-action ones I've watched, and... This is the first, and well, well, yeah, before this one, there was the Jendi Tartakovsky Clone Wars, but other than this, this is the first. But, you know, if you want my thoughts on the individual seasons of this show, check that playlist. And, yeah. Recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in a separate video, since a uh, movie's running time is significantly shorter than a show. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. May the Force be with you.